Hello there, everyone. This is Beth Miller with Wagtown Wednesday and other special reports. And today I have a real treat for you, someone who you've probably wanted to happen all your life, somebody who gets it in terms of making a difference for dogs everywhere. And I'm very excited to talk with him about a project that he's working on and his vision for what that could mean for the future of dogs and for all of us. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to Kieran Walsh, who has written an amazing book, Leo or One-Eyed Leo. And I want him to kind of introduce you to this wonderful character in the way that sets up why you did this. So first of all, welcome so much for coming on board with us to talk a little bit today, Kieran. Thank you very much, Beth. I'm delighted to be with you. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about the inspiration for this, because from what I understand, your background was in finance. So how did you go from dollars to dogs? From dollars to dogs, I was out walking on the hillside just south of Dublin um, by 2015, it was only over six years ago. And okay. I was walking past this building which looked quite interesting from the road and there's a little plaque outside it. And it was a former British police station and that sort of historical note got my attention and I remember hearing just enormously loud dog barking from inside the walls and I sort of wondered uh. what this was and then I discovered it was actually a rescue shelter so oh, okay. as, as, as the time passed I decided I'd ring them up and see if they want anybody to help walk the dogs and oh. um, on the first day inside, I sort of discovered or I sort of felt the, dog, the dogs were telling me that this is really where I should be. And within, I think, wow. weeks, the manager of the rescue shelter had me in a training course to be a dog trainer. And the rest, as they all happened. Wow. wow. So you, had you been a trainer before or did you come into that cold and you, they just knew? Um, I came in cold, but I, I would I would say my friends and family were telling me for years and years and years, I have something with animals, and I, I always thought everybody has this anyway, and it's nothing special, which is, I seem to have some calming effect on dogs um, and horses when, when oh. I'm near them, and it... Um, I sort of discovered many years later why some people have it and why some people don't have it. <laughs> yes, why is that? What's the secret? Um, well, the secret is actually scientifically proven. and It was proven by a university, an Italian university study. And the, there was a student who had this thesis, um, do, do dogs recognize people who are nervous of them? And then do dogs buy into an interaction with that, and um, I think in about, if I have this right, about 2017 or 18, the study was undertaken, where I think it was about 100 students in an Italian university were brought to the cinema. And they were split into two groups. And before they went into the theaters, they each group was given a, each individual was given a cotton t-shirt, a sterilized cotton t-shirt to wear while they watched the movie. So one group watched The Jungle Book, which was a happy romantic movie. And the second group watched The Shining, which is a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and as the, as every individual came out, they, they, their t-shirt was removed and put in and sealed in, in a plastic bag. That bag was then sent color coded, but sent at random to 100 volunteers, dog owning volunteers. And the t shirt was the instruction for the dog owner was put your dog in one part of the house, take out the t shirt in your living room or where you'd normally have the dog in the evening, wave it about so the scent of the person who watched the movie is in the air, then leave it beside you on the chair. And after five minutes, call the dog in and see what happens. And the, the results left no doubt at all, which was the people who were in the happy mood, um, the T-shirt that came from the happy mood movie, attracted the dog into the room. And a lot of the owners said the dog tried to get closer to them than ever before. Now, really? for, the group, for the group 
that was that attended the Shining movie, um, the dogs became anxious as soon as they came near the room, and in some cases, the dogs aggressively tried to leave the house. Wow. So I think the point there is, if you have a calm personality and you look after yourself, you're probably sending out the hormone. Sorry, the is it the, the what's the word I'm looking for? Beginning the pheromones. The pheromones. Um, straight out to a dog. Unfortunately, people don't pick that up as easily as animals. But um, as I say, dogs use a scent the way we would use a radar. And they they know more about us and they probably know more about the stranger who went to the movie than they <laughs> <laughs> almost automatically. So they have their dossier. <laughs> so I I I I think in a lot of ways it's it's um I suppose the one lesson I learned from that particular study is, and you probably have a lot of people who are working with animals, but they don't care enough, they don't take enough care of themselves. And they're probably sending out, you know, they're probably overstressed, even though they're training dogs or looking after dogs. Okay. And they have the right training and the right attitude, but their pheromones um, may leave something to be desired. Mm-hmm. Well, it, you know, I've, I've been talking to you for a few minutes here and I've already had chills three times of things you've said. Uh, like when you walked into the shelter and you just had this feeling like the dogs were telling you, I mean, that's just that experience, I think everybody would like to have that where you feel like you're home when you're in a position to make such an impact. And, you know, your, your conversation about how you came to see the world and um, that the dogs do have that demeanor. And I think to some extent, it sounds to me a lot like where people talk about fear free, that you kind of create an environment where they can learn because they're not afraid of anything. But yours is almost like you're letting them in to who you are and what you want to do and, and the good intent and the you know serenity that you bring in which yeah i mean you've seen people getting upset or you know uh, emergent situations or legal situations where everything is elevated and the instruction is to just you know a lethal reaction because you can't control it but there's no conversation about what kind of environment are you bringing to the situation that's going to change the behavior of everyone including the dogs and I think that, you know, kind of leans itself into the concept that you later developed, which is the complete approach of throwing it out the window and saying, what if we knew nothing about what we're doing with dogs and, you know, not to be super flattery, but how can we be more Kieran? How can we all have a little more of what you bring to the table that the dogs are benefiting from? So can you walk me through kind of that journey that you took from that from the barn to the book so to speak barn to the book yes um i suppose the simplest way to describe this is at the at the rescue shelter where i used to volunteer quite a lot um every, every day we'd have our cup of teas or whatever and we'd we'd Eventually, this conversation would talk about a dog that came into the shelter or somebody came in and or, and it always, you know, oh, there's no responsibility there or there's irresponsibility there and there's no responsible dog ownership. And this, no matter where I went in the dog training industry, this conversation, it came up like a sore thumb. And it was always just under the surface. And I remember asking a lot of dog trainers and experts, what does that actually mean to you? And what's ah. quite surprising is very few people had the same answer. Yes. You know? Well, it means maybe they should be doing this or they should be cleaning up after themselves or they should have the normal lead, not a flexi lead. So right. what was quite obvious was that yeah. there, there, there was no consensus on where the basic platform or um, yeah, that central understanding that's central common understanding. that, you know, is, is, is good for the dogs. Yeah, good, in other words, good for all of us, really. Yeah, the, 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 there was no sort of A, A to Z of here's the constitution of responsible dog ownership. It's rather, <laughs> here's a detail and here's another detail. Yeah, a passionate constitution. Everyone's right, right? <laughs> so. Well, I'm using the word constitution here in a sort of a, a legal format where 
you have a base <laughs> that, that the entire system or population can buy into. Now, quite often that, that, that out of necessity would be a bit vague. In other words, mm -hmm. should the owner have responsibility? Yes, and here's, here's the minimum that an owner should have or what a society should have. But okay. the, the one area where um, I, I, that sort of caught me again and again and again was if the dog was actually to say what responsible ownership is, what would the dog say? Now, the only way you could sort of come up with any fair ideas of what the dog might say um, was basically to sit in its cage, which I did over, over a number of days in a rescue shelter. I, when, when one of the cages was free, I just went in there you and did. I just sat down. Yes. But you, you did? Yes. Oh, really? And you spent yeah. overnight? No, no, not <laughs> overnight. No. I was like, man, that's commitment. <laughs> I only look mad. I'm not completely <laughs> mad, but thank you anyway. Okay. <laughs> no, no, just just the exercise of sitting down in a cage where a dog would spend about 23 hours a day, most days, on, on, until it's lucky enough to be adopted. And it's just just to get the feeling of it, you know, the the cement pavement, the cement floor, the wires, the noise all around, the image of the lock, and. What I was sort of hoping for was, was that I get an experience the way I get from dogs is that I get a feeling of what a, an animal is trying to say. And then I was hoping, well, what's the feeling of the cage trying to tell me? And, wow. and what I sort of looked at was there were, interestingly enough, there were sort of four common factors that kept every dog in its cage. Okay. So, right. So. <laughs> first one is a very simple one, if you like, that's, that's sort of the, the base of the cage is there are more dogs out there than there are homes to go into. So globally, there's about 900 million dogs on planet Earth. And, okay. there's, and 200 million of those are street dogs. And so if you go to some countries like, you know, most of the countries in Europe, there's very few, if any, street dogs, other countries, they're, they're quite common. Um, South America, it's as high as I think 70% of the dogs are street dogs, and, and only 30% wow. are um, domesticated. Okay. So, so the, the first question really is, is it supply and I say availability of families or individuals being able to keep a dog? Um, then this, the, the, the second- you know, I'm gonna stop you, that availability of homes, that's so different than demand. You know, I, I never really thought about it that way, that we're not talking about just supply and demand, there is demand, but it's a totally different ball game to do what you just said, which is to consider what's really available, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then what's qualified based on that responsibility and just, yeah, so go on. I, I like fascinated right. by this journey. We'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. That's actually the core of, of the reasoning behind the book. So the, the, the next pillar I sort of looked at was you have to supply them. What's the regulation like? In other words, what's the governance of the market? Mm -hmm. And the third factor, the, the following factor would be how the oversupply is, is addressed. So the first problem is the governance of it. And what, what's quite unusual about this is, is to get a clear indication of how the governance works. You really have to go to the legal committees within countries that inform judicial departments and governments. So for example, in the States, things are quite good because you actually have animal rights committees informing mm -hmm. the judicial system. In a lot of other countries, you certainly have legal committees on taxation, on agriculture, but certainly not on animal rights. Okay. And, and so when, when that's missing in a country, well then anything below that is running without a foundation and is depending on possibly years and years and years of lobbying without, mm -hmm. without, any, without much hope of success. It's, it's, right. it's, just, it's just the nature of it. Um, and what you have in certain countries, or let's say in most countries, is because of the legal deficiency, be that part or totally, totally deficient or dysfunctional, 
-hmm. you end up with a charity or voluntary sector trying to mop up the problem. Mm -hmm. And okay. then somewhere in between those two forces, you get a lot of dog trainers and if you like dog professionals or dog businesses trying to make sense um, of one world and the other world. But what I find and find continuously is that the professionals in the middle sort of lean towards what we would call the leafy green suburbs. In other words, people with the money that can actually pay for their services, you know, it's absolutely fine. But then it basically means two things happen, that the system of overproduction and an undersupply of quality homes to put the dog is into will never be addressed. And then the really sad factor that's, that's sort of guaranteeing the mess will continue for the next 10 or 20 years, unless everybody thinks differently, is what I would call the, the mafia um, puppy mills. And these are basically- Which, Like mafia on my door? Um, so, the, like those mafia. type of people, yep, yep. Would so, that, that would intimidate me. How about you? <laughs> Right. We'll, we'll get back to intimidation later. <laughs> but, Man. But, uh, but no, what, what, what we're talking about here is um, you have three basic types of dog breeders. So you'd have your reputable commercial breeders. And the, these, are, uh, these are very different type of person. Um, you're talking about people who would be third or fourth generation of say Dalmatian breeders or whatever. So highly specialized um, to the point that they're actually co-owners of any dog that leaves their establishment. So if you buy a dog from these people, you're not the outright owner, you're a co-owner and they can take it oh. back if there's a hint of abuse or a veterinary report um, wow. unfavorable to you. You know, So I would say th these are sort of, Clothes are like the expert artists, and they're while they do exist, and we do mention them in in the book, the one eyed Leo book. They're they're not part of the problem, I would say. They they exist independently. It's like a different country in the dog world. <laughs> um, I've met a few people who live in this world. Absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. The the one thing I would share with them is they as a collective they feel or as individuals, they feel frustrated that the collective isn't doing enough to address the greater problem. Mm -hmm. So, and so we'll come back to that maybe later, but they, they as I said, the complex, the, the, the problem is extremely complex. So the, that's the first group. The second group of dog producers, dog breeders would be, if you like your accidental breeder who has two or three extra dogs and is trying to get rid of them quickly. <laughs> yes. And now after that, you are talking about warehouse production. And this is where the mafia, it's organized crime. It's done very cleverly. It's, they, they make their money. Um, they depend on ill-informed parents succumbing to pressure from children to get a dog and get a dog quickly. Okay. And out comes the credit card. Lovely picture on the internet. Lovely review. Perfect pup, perfect dog. Yeah, you swipe with the credit card, you go and collect it from a car park or a house or somewhere. And in four out of seven of these cases, the dog will fall ill quite quickly. Sorry, in, in most of these cases, the dog will wow. fall ill quite quickly. And in Four out of seven of these cases that, that's brought to the vet, the vet will tell the owner, sorry, this dog is so genetically damaged or poorly evolved that the producing mother probably had three litters within 15, 16 months. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will have to put the dog down immediately. Wow. Uh, now, not only is that money down the drain, but the psychological damage within the house is enormous. And to put this in perspective, maybe to go back to my financial world where I feel most comfortable in statistical terms, mm -hmm. and this is just for, for your listeners in the States, the way this chain of events works is the conversation where a child asks for a dog, 
And that's actually the, the, the name of the book. It's when your child asks for a dog, one-eyed Leo guides the conversation. So, so you, the way we estimate this figure is you take the total number of dogs in a country. So in the States, it's roughly about nine, 90 million domestic dogs. Now, every year, 10% of that national dog herd will reach the end of its days. In other words, natural mortality. And the natural mortality figure is usually equal to the, nat to the adoption rate. So okay. you'll have some families who have had a dog and they will no longer, they've had their day. And then you've other families who never had a dog and they'll adopt it for the first time. And so it, it's usually constant. Those two figures are, are very constant everywhere in the world. So in the States, really? yeah. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. That this is a global it, mindset. It, it doesn't go up much, it doesn't go down much. Yeah. And wow. What you find in some countries, even the number of stray dogs, sort of, it's flatlined year after year after year. So, wow. so we're not making the, it enough difference. No, um, uh, you know, if you to put this in its entirety, the SPCA, the first SPCA was set up in 1824. Okay. In other words, just short of 200 long time years. Ago. Yeah. Long time ago. And the approach hasn't really gone beyond mopping up the problem. I know a lot of people who work in the SBCA um, will say that's a very unfair criticism. But when you start to look at the statistics, the government statistics of every year, the number of stray dogs is almost the same as the year before, the year before that. So figures figures can't lie that's I'm sorry, I'm sorry. that's that's the, re the reality of it yeah yeah so so to go back to the formulas as talking about in the states um you've roughly about 8.5 million dogs are adopted every year and what you'll get is about 50 percent of those will come through rescue shelters and spcas uh 15 percent from the elite breeders that we were talking about that's if you're if you're lucky, because <laughs> quite often these have two or three years waiting lists. Mm -hmm. And then the other 35% will be a mix of your accidental neighbor or friend that has a dog to spare, but the majority will be the mafia gangs, the puppy mills, and the stolen dogs. So to run wow. to run the link of statistics that you look at the number of dogs being adopted and into families. So it's basically one fifth of dogs that are adopted will be adopted by a person 60 years plus. And their uh -huh. husband or the wife or partner died. The house is quiet. And a dog will end up slowly in their house. It won't be from today to tomorrow. And they let they'll talk to people and some somehow the dog ends up there and it's known they're <laughs> looking and it's it, and yeah. the chances the chances of that dog being resurrendered or to the rescue shelter is quite low because there's a sort of a lot of preparation made by accident okay. or made by sort of like us oh uh, yeah so the longer the ramp the yeah. longer the stay perfect nice way to put it <laughs> <laughs> so wow. the other four Go ahead. No, I was gonna say that that does again, it changes the way you look at things. You know, I know that they check boxes, but I don't know that there's anything about how long have you considered having this. You know what I mean? I don't know that there's a measure for that. Maybe there are there are in some places, but that's an interesting uh point for discerning who should have a dog and is that a suitable environment? But it's almost like it's I, I, I don't, can't imagine that it's off the radar, but it's not, it sounds like it's not being triaged to being important enough to have some serious conversations that take longer than how, how quickly can I get the dog out of here and take it home with me, which I think yeah, is I, more typical mindset. Again, it's, it's, that's the core of the book that the timelines are so important, you know, that, that okay. it's, um, Again, to go back to the in the banking world, we, we always talk about structure and time, no matter what the problem is. We never talk about money. Well, we talk about money, but <laughs> the priority is like, the priority, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> the priority is 
you know, when something goes wrong, the first three questions are always, what's the structure? What's the structure? What's the structure? And then we look at the timelines straight away. What's the timeline involved here? And what I find um, whenever I look at the posts up on LinkedIn or Facebook or any of these from rescue shelters or from dog trainers, it's the timelines are incredibly short. Like it's dog X has only three more days unless we can find a home for it. And it's, it's, it's quite incredible that when you examine the timelines of projects or desires from the profession, from the dog training profession and the rescue shelter world, mm -hmm. those timelines tend to be very, very limited. And that's something we'll come on to later, but the way of thinking according to timelines, it has to change if anything else has to change. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about changing techniques. I'm yeah. not talking about um, a modification of policies or professionals. And, but I'm talking about if a discussion on how we look at things according to timelines would actually change a lot. Okay. So, so to go back to the time, and this is this is this is where it's going to hit home to everybody who's listening to this. In the states, you have roughly eight million dogs are adopted each year. Now, so you divide in the, that eight million into 365, and you get the daily average. You divide whatever number you have by 86,400, which is the number of seconds in a day. Okay. And then you end up with a child asking their parents for a dog at least once. This conversation will happen at least once every 4.3 seconds somewhere in the US. Wow. Each day, 4.3 seconds. A child wow. somewhere will, for the first time, mention, "Oh, when are we getting a dog?" Or mm -hmm. did you see that? It, it okay. It's it's not going to be a developed conversation, but the first hint of it will happen for the first time once every four point yeah. three seconds. And that child is usually between the ages of five and twelve. Okay, and it's interesting that that would go from the you know twenty second conversation of "I want a dog, please, 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 please" to "No, you're not ready." Period to that that conversation is rarely over <laughs> you know it's always that's the start of the knowing for the parent you know that oh this is now going to be a part of our lives how, in many cases how long can I put them off and you know and I don't know that there's a matchup I mean did you find then that there wasn't an alignment of the investment that the kid is making in making their case is a longer ramp than the parent saying yes it seems like it's more like wearing them down instead of informing them up. Did you find that as well? Right, I, I, I'd say just to go before that, I'm, I'm going to just give you the bigger picture first, Beth, if that's okay. And okay. Then, then I'm going to yeah. go zone in on, on the different links in the chain, which is, okay. so this conversation will happen for the first time every 4.3 seconds. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the statistics, how often are dogs left to rescue shelters in the US? It's once every 4.5 seconds. Wow. How often are dogs euthanized? It's every 45 seconds. See, it's total number of dogs by days, by seconds. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the estimated profits of the mafia and how much they're making. And again, now this is a figure that's very hard to pin down. And it's like a lot of things in the dog world. The statistics could be way off, but mm -hmm. you can come to a sort of a happy average. And my estimate would be Roughly every second, one of these mafia warehouses have a profit of about one hundred and thirty dollars. Wow! How did you um, come up with that number? Is that right? They, 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 it's it's guesswork. Um, like one of the things you'll read quite often is the sale of um, these warehouse puppy mill dogs is mm -hmm. not far behind the sale of illegal drugs and firearms. Oh, okay. So it's quite easy to get that, to, to get the figures for that. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing is you'll have um, estimates coming out of the SPCA national headquarters and mm -hmm. the Humane Society. They'll all come out with different figures. Um, like I think Vancouver University comes out with some. So they, the, you, you, you read a little bit and you get to say, well, okay, it's somewhere in, in here and you look for a happy mm -hmm. medium. But right. what's, what, what's undeniable is these figures do exist. In other words, if there's 
so many people not getting their dog from rescue shelters, then where are they getting them from? And then you look at court reports of convicted criminals who might be running other operations plus a puppy mill. Well, mm -hmm. then you can see where it all connects. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the so so the whole trick of the book, um, when your child asks for a dog, one eyed Leo guides the conversation. Is how can you break this cause and effect? And there's no point in sitting down with people who run the puppy mills. They they have a fixed business. They won't give you the time of day. They're not interested mm -hmm. in changing. The money's very good. Um, with legislators. It's really, they will answer to the pet industry or some very strong lobbying. And there's always a fear of changing the law because you have what's, what's often known as the law of unintended consequences. You change the law in one direction and things are three or four times right. worse. And then your political career is down the drain immediately. Yes, yeah. and the, 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 the popular question of how are you gonna pay for that? Are you we have we got rid of public smoking and I forget how many years there were like 1-800 numbers we could call in and report a restaurant that was allowing smoking but there was no one to follow up on the phone call so it's again you know to make a shift this big you're right it needs to be seismic and there needs to be teeth behind it no pun intended uh, for people to make those changes because if you say well it has to be this way now it isn't until people actually take that action because so it's yeah. it's you know, it can be devastating to your point I, mean, I i like the way that you sort of weaved reality um and not it's, it's to say globally even seems limiting you know it's it's just as a species you know what are we doing here what are we causing and what are we capable of yeah yeah that's um i think that leads us nicely back to your question of the ramp and the child and what the child put into the question <laughs> and the i i would say that the, the point of the question is one uh most parents are hit unawares in other words it comes so quickly and there's no preparation on how to handle it and very often from the parents i've talked to it's the question is asked after one of their classmates tell them about their dog at home or they're brought to the other house and then suddenly right. it's dogs are awesome everybody wants yeah. one right <laughs> yeah so like like why 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 am i not being treated like my classmates and you know this this is totally unfair <laughs> but and the difficulty for the parent is it's probably the first time in that family's life where if the parent says yes or the parent says no it can only go in one or two directions now if the parent says no it's probably the first serious rejection of the child's desires oh. so, right so yeah. you know you're not talking about saying no to a bicycle you know you're you know mo can you wait six months and we'll get you a bicycle but it's it's every child will sort of expect to have a bicycle at some stage but a parent might know we can't afford to have a dog we can't we don't have the space for one mm -hmm. um or, but then at the same time the parent might know we do have the space but we have to have a certain breed of dog and then a certain temperament and so on so they i'd say with with most parents the gravity of the question hits them before they actually understand the question okay so, so they go they, into this reaction mode? They go into the reaction mode and the difficulty is if they say no, they've bought themselves into a lot of psychological damage, a lot of, a lot of problems over the next few weeks and there's a serious rejection. It mm -hmm. might be overcome quickly, it might have years and years of effect, it might be the beginning of something very negative, but it is within itself quite serious. To say no to a child on an issue like this mm -hmm. now if the parent says yes um the parent has signed um, an open season hunting season <laughs> open season <laughs> hunting trip where the child is armed to say well when 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 <laughs> and that may never end now the idea with the whole book is it's the first 
book in the world to ever come between the child and the parent on this issue. And the trick to it is the parent doesn't have to say yes or no. And the book is set up in four basic parts. So the first one okay. is it's, it's a very simple love story between a one-eyed disabled dog who lives in a rescue shelter called Leo. Oh. And the idea behind it is the children make this immediate attachment as so often happens. But the dog says, well, the type of house and the type of family I would like to live in must understand the following. So in other words, Leo interviews them very subtly and sets out, here's my terms and conditions. Now, if the children want to go ahead with that, they have to do some learning tasks, which are provided in the book. And they have to understand things like, what's the breed of the dog? How much walking does this type of dog need? What do we do if the dog poos in the house? So it goes through it step by step, like a, a care plan. Mm -hmm. And what we've discovered in the focus groups is three to four of the children reading it out of every 10 have said, ah, it was a good idea at the beginning, but um, this idea of I'd have to share my pocket money with a dog. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't think so. so. And I'd have to give up the sports day, you know, to bring the, to, to walk with the parents and everybody. So mm -hmm. the trick to the whole book is it's, it's a bit like the get out of jail free card in a game of Monopoly. The parents don't have to answer the question. Okay. Now, now, on the other hand, if the child actually persists, goes through it, does all the learning tasks, brings the parents to the local rescue shelter and does all the work. It builds into this, um, what I would call a university module in resource management, that the child will be very much a good manager of okay. how you manage everything, you know, from the tasks to which is very important, the actual timelines. And you'll have your six or seven year old fully aware that in that, this breed is only expected to last maybe 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. And we even have a chapter in there about visiting the vet on the dog's last day or even the vet to get checked up regularly. Wow. So, and the children are in the learning task on that module, asked to talk with neighbors who had a dog and the dog died and how they, they handled the situation. And on each chapter at each learning task, the child has to sign up so they will know quickly enough if this is for the family or if this is okay. not for the family. So they have sort of an out each each module. They're like, mm, no, and then come back into it. It sounds like it's not a yes or no. It's more like, you know, having a personal consultant for the kid, much like the parents go through all those questions. But I think that the no comes from their understanding that the kid hasn't gone through those things. We assume that they can't understand those things. And that makes the assumption that all kids are the same in terms of their understanding of how to take care of dogs. Obviously, the kids are very different. Their levels of responsibility and things like that change. But there's still, even for adults, there's no way to fully communicate to someone the impact of the dog on your life. And I think that's one of those things that Leo brings to the table is the question of impact. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? On, on impact, I would say, um, and I think this may be a very important fact to get out there, which is um, we had a team of six working on sort of the core of the book and then about 50 experts, including yourself, <laughs> making contributions here, there and everywhere. And it, it took the best part of a year to clobber this together. That's the only way I could put it. You know, it, it, so the framework was written over a weekend and then the actual book from the framework. In other words, we have the constitution of what it might look like. Mm -hmm. And one, one of the aspects that um, evolved was this notion of how a child learns the building blocks of respect in a relationship. And that's in the book. And like one of the, the first lessons Leo tells them is that 
he knows everybody loves dogs, but he preferred to be respected and then loved. Okay. And, and the, the, the trick with the book is it teaches children and to some extent families about the basic building blocks of taking this lovely notion of respect in a love story into the cold detail of reality. Um, we even have a narrative for the parents to read alongside the, um, the love story so that the parents actually understand the why respect. and the and the science behind it. You know, we, we have, for example, a simple um, chapter on feeding the dog and the importance of giving the dog his own space and everything and the dangers of a bite incident by interfering with the dog. So it's, it's the child then will basically go, well, yeah, we, we know the nice side, but here's the detail. And then it's for the parents to actually understand the science behind it and then you have this it's, it's a sort of a bonding exercise in in how children can both build contracts and manage contracts you know between animals their siblings their parents and even wider society okay. so it's um it's it's in a way every sentence or every chapter in the book is sort of loaded um with three or four messages and okay. the, the idea, maybe the, the big idea is one we talked about at the, at the beginning was we remove the possibility of a dog ending up in a home from the position of a very quick decision, a quick purchase um, to a long-term project. So we tried to build the entire thing on timelines that everybody can agree on and agree on simply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very much the gap that people feel, you know, because there's also that variation of learning styles. And um, where you were talking about that, I thought, you know, what age group would most benefit from this? And you know, is there a, is there a uh, sort of a range where you would say that it's appropriate for all, but it, you know, you use it in different ways or, or is it, is it really geared toward that sweet spot age group where, you know, the question is coming eventually? Ah, yes. Um, all of the above, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, now what I mean by that is they, the book is designed for this conversation. Okay. When your child asks for a dog, that's, mm -hmm. that's where it, it's all geared up. Now, that said, the, the other part of the book is about a quarter of it, which is very detailed information for every dog owner regardless of the age so mm -hmm. the first the, the, the primary focus is on say the five to 12 year old because there's a love story in there mm -hmm. then the narrative and the, the rest of it looks at the stuff parents or even established dog owners need to know and we've things like how you would choose a dog trainer and the checklists and how you would talk to them, the same with pet insurance companies, how you should be talking to them, not how they should be talking to you. Mm -hmm. we've, we've one very important chapter in there called What If? And this is basically the MAP program. In other words, appointing someone who can step into the dog owner's shoes mm -hmm. if the dog owner isn't able to function. So that can be anything from the legal status of the owner changing from divorce, disability, disease, something that could happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. you know, e even delay or getting locked down in a foreign country, coming back and you have to go into quarantine. And then discovering the local charity with the police have taken your dogs. And then by the time you're back home, you'll discover that they've been taken to the shelter, but then adopted out somewhere else. And then you will mm -hmm. never see them again. That's the end of yeah. it. Mm -hmm. um, so we basically have, um, this is from a lovely chapter that was put in there by Debbie Hamilton, um, the animal rights lawyer and a, a, a advocate. And she basically puts this chapter together in very simple language, how, your, how you can protect your dog's legal position if your legal status changes. Mm -hmm. And there's even a form there in very simple English for everybody to fill out saying, I appoint this person these are the functions. This is the long, the short term approach. And then here's the long term approach. And mm -hmm. quite simply, you stick that on your fridge under 
under your telephone, give it to your vet, give it to your neighbors. So if one day you don't turn up and the dogs are in trouble, you have a community that knows how to activate a program and who's going to take charge immediately. Yeah, it's so important. I knew I interviewed that run long ago, and now we're in the process of creating that whole structure, you know, because we're talking about, you know, we have Sesto where we're fostering a service dog puppy, but then like, what's our dog journey down the road? And I am a big researcher. So it's sort of like, where is this coming from? What kind of breed is right for me to your point? And it, it's, it is, it does feel like a ramp. You know, you get to that point where you're like, okay, now I feel like I can pull the trigger on this because I understand the relationship that I'm going to have with this dog. And I think that it, there are probably some aha moments in there for the parents that thought, well, we understand that it's a big responsibility, but saying it's a big responsibility, I think that they say, who's going to feed it, walk it and pick up its poop. Yeah. And they just think, and if they can do that, that's good. I mean, I have a calendar that kids do for a month and sometimes that's enough to your point, you know, sort of say, well, maybe we're not ready for a dog. If they can do it, then there would be a conversation. And, and that's exactly what you're having them do. And I really like the, I, the social emotional impact of having the conversation occur between a dog and the kids in a sense, because that sort of begins that respect relationship. Am I interpreting that correctly? Absolutely correct. It, I, I go slightly further than that saying that if, if we look at dogs as a very important part of our society that could actually change it for the better, and you know, being there to be, if you like, a reflection as well as a sort of a, a teaching element of society that-, that Yeah, they if, are the means to who we can become. Lovely, yes, yes. And um, it's, you know, a, an important part of this is if we can get the timelines and the consideration right before anybody mm -hmm. acquires a dog, then the um, puppy mills will quite simply disappear because there will be no market for them. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that, you know, it's, yeah. it's, and the, it, it, I, you know, what I would always say is the organized crime and the mafia gangs that are involved in this are there mm -hmm. simply because society hasn't organized things better. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, somebody did ask me if I, you know, I, I, I have always described these puppy mills as mafias. And somebody asked me if I'd worry about them knocking on my door one day. And I would actually be happy to invite them in for a cup of tea for the simple reason it won't happen. Because <laughs> if the market starts to decrease, what you'll find is, and people in organized crimes, they tend to be very bright. That's why they're always on the, under the police Ed. radar. Mm -hmm. um, okay, some get caught eventually, but the, the point I'm getting at here is they're very good at reading the market and where the money is, be that drugs or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if one day they see this isn't making money, let's get out of here quick, lads. They're gone. It's as simple as that. And um, I would say, you know, when you look at um, crime, it's usually there because a society is not inclusive enough or able actually to see long term and manage these things. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have with the dog world is if we can get our timelines right and be ready for this question of when your child asks for a dog, that would be enough to change to change most societies very very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. I think there's a there's such a powerful resonating effect when we have conversations that start in the classroom and then go to the living room, as I say, and the ability for kids to better understand than we do how simple it really is. You know, I mean, they're like, I love dogs. I know I'm going to love dogs, and I want a dog. Well, there's step one, but for them to understand the impact that that does. And I always say for dog friendliness, it's like when you plop a poodle into a town and there's that ripple effect. Well, the way that it starts is I had a little post-it note when I first started and it says dog on it. And then it says kids and family and neighbors and schools. And so there's this huge impact. And I think, you know, the behavior of the kids and the parents then precipitate an, um, an expectation from other kids 
They, yeah. they all want to hear about it when it's new and it's cute and all of the bad behavior is excused because they're a puppy. Yeah. And so it just becomes this thing that like, we know it's going to be a mess and then they'll end up being like Lassie or, you know, some perfect dog that will rescue you from the well. But in reality, people are, you know, I don't want to say quitters, but, you know, if you can get the dog to the point where they're good enough for you, that very rarely matches up what somebody else would think is appropriate dog behavior, which all, as we say, trickles down to the other end of the leash, which is us expecting the dog to navigate its own way and then expecting to have a child understand how to walk with them is completely missed, in my opinion. I know there are a lot of camps and education programs and outreach to the schools, but you're talking about at the household level, which I love that about it, that you're talking about literally changing the world one curious kid at a time. True. Yeah. So I love that about that. I love that. So now what are your plans next with the book? I know that it's now uh, sort of being uh, picked up by various rescue and animal welfare organizations. I know with Wagtown, we're thrilled about it. And uh, because a lot of us have that same message, but a lot of us, you know, we want to disrupt that. We, we want to rewrite that constitution of what it's like with the recognition that like, for instance, in the States, every single state has hundreds of people working on the puppy mill problem, but it's, it trickles down into, you know, different departments of agriculture and health and, and a lot of people that have everything figured out already in terms of their processes. You need people that say, this is going to be really hard, just like owning a dog, but it's worth it because we we have this ramp. We just need a longer ramp on getting the dog and a shorter ramp on making the difference happen. And I love the fact that that's exactly what you've done with this incredible piece that you've done. So yeah, it makes me beg the question of, you know, how, what are some ways that people that watch this video can help obviously getting the book, sharing it with friends. Um, I'm thinking, you know, school libraries, rescue organizations. I know you're starting to get some really positive feedback and participation and partnerships with large animal welfare organizations down to the single person making that impact. Do you have um, any like final words of if you want to be a part of this revolution of how we view animals and disadvantaged situations and inequity and the lack of planning, all of those things, what's a, what's a person to do? Well, I'm like the old farmyard dog. I will talk to everybody and anybody. <laughs> it's, as, it's as simple as that. So um, I would just love to see it out there um, in every child's hands as quickly as possible. So if there's a dog trainer watching this or a rescue shelter or an organization, um, just ask me and we'll come up with some way of putting it together to make sure everybody ha is happy and everybody can, can use it. Um, I would say the where it's gone so far, maybe to give a little bit of background that, that um, we were supported by dogwise.com, which is one of the leading American publishing companies for expert dog books. And it, the book went through um, a review panel and it's been true reviews from SPCAs and almost everybody under the sun. And it's got incredible backing at the moment. But um, it's, it's really, if any of your listeners want to have a copy, I make a copy available. And if okay. you want to get it into your organization, um, what I'm looking at is how do we get it to stick for about five years? And mm -hmm. one, one of the things, you know, that, that, that has sort of hit me on the journey is you have a huge amount of money um, in the dog industry, the pet industry, that doesn't go to the organizations involved. So I'm basically saying, look, if there's an organization that wants to make this as part of their annual fundraising or daily fundraising, um, I'd be quite happy to talk and we can come up with, with, with a way to make that um, workable for everyone over, mm -hmm. a long, over a long time. So it's, um, it's, I think we've we probably had about a hundred people working on it at this stage in one form or another. So I'd love to talk to you in three or six months time to see we've a hundred organizations working with us now and that, 
that would that would make the difference. But mm -hmm. um, so we have a couple of rescue shelters moving with it, but I'd love to to get into the the hundreds before too long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think there's uh, this knee jerk reaction, at least in the states, of you know, I want a dog, and then you decide which route you want to go. And if you do go the rescue route, then you go to Petfinder or one of those that can match you up and show you what's available. And I know a lot of people who are sort of in this state of consternation, like, sh should I get a dog? Do I have the time for this, you know, as an adult, but they're always on some kind of website looking at the dogs. And they, then they say, when I see one that speaks to me, then I'll know, and I'll go get this dog. But still, there's no speaking to you about healthcare and about emergency situations and about the responsibility and the activity level. It's still about um, vetting what it looks like and that you feel like you have this soulmate with it. But it doesn't include something that when you click that before the window pops up, what if something else came up that said, did you know that you should actually learn about having a dog <laughs> before you get one? instead of learn as you go, which is kind of the childhood method. But even then you take classes on even just how to actually have the birth. And then there are enrich enrichment programs. And I think um, at least in the state, and I'm seeing indications of this worldwide, at the more we humanize dogs and the more we consider companion animals to have gone from things that were owned to things that are a part of the family, to people who view the dog as a child of theirs, to people who do feel like that dog is their soulmate, people who've been sort of rescued either physically or emotionally or mentally from a situation through their dog. And so you, when you put all those pieces together, you realize that we're investing in something that we now place much more value in. So let's act like it. Let's talk to Leo so that when we do make those huge decisions and to respect the dog enough to know that when they say, you want, to, you want me to be friends with you forever, that when you say yes back, the expectation is understood because of those conversations with Leo. So I'm, I'm really thrilled that, you know, we've talked about it many times and to have seen uh, the, the pickup um, of pace of people reaching out and the response that you're getting to people who want to partner, who want to support, and that understand that this could really be a huge impact item if they would just take a minute to as to your point maybe have that moment their aha moment of i think that i'm doing everything i can but there might be something that you're completely blind to and i feel like that's what you have here is it's so obvious and so needed but i think people just figured we'll figure it out or i'll watch a few youtube videos and have friends of mine mostly through complaints where, you know, just understand you're going to need this. And did you know that it costs this much to get them neutered, you know, whatever, but that I think still doesn't include the, the respect that you're talking about. And if we can start those conversations with little children, then imagine how humane they will be and how much better they'll understand how to respect a dog and how to provide them with a rewarding and loving forever home that really matches the expectations and the delivery of, you know, the behavior by the parents and the dog. So I, I don't know, I would love to stay in touch on this and, you know, maybe we can, you know, touch base, like you said, in about six months, I have a feeling through Rebound Dog and some other organizations that we're involved with that are very disruptive, catalyzing change, breaking down barriers of communication and really bringing people together who are not, they're passionate about it, but they're so um, I don't know, they're attracting that kind of vibrancy in terms of who you are as a person, putting those people in a room, matching like you and I talking about this. You know, there are so many parallels between the work that you and I do to make the world better in that way. And I think there just needs to be fewer walls between us. And so I think this conversation is an example of one of those walls toppling. And now I have a more thorough understanding of what it means to create a dog-friendly community, and it is by creating a dog friendly home. You know, it's, it's got to be good for the dog. And in my opinion, dog friendly doesn't mean dogs everywhere. It's where dogs were appropriate and where it's okay for the dog to be there, respecting the dog's opinion about maybe you feel like you want to take your dog everywhere, but the dog is like, 
I did not sign up for this and you did not evaluate who I am and how I react. And so that sort of kindred spirit um, theme that you and I have going here is to realize that there's more to it. That it's not just about play dates and taking your dog to a patio. It's it's so much bigger than that. So I personally wanted to thank you for for creating something like this that's you know, in my opinion, going to be hugely impactful. The trajectory is very inspiring to see already. And so I just wanted to thank you so much for helping me better understand that and talk to viewers about the potential and hopefully inspire not just, you know, purchase of the books, but I would encourage people to get a copy for yourself. But then if you have a rescue organization, a shelter, people who foster, anyone who would benefit from having that conversation with others, in addition to people, especially this time of year, people are always, you know, it's a great time to get a dog. Well, then spring comes. It's a great time to get a dog. And so that sense of urgency comes up again because it's not something that's being talked about. So I'm encouraging you also to get a couple extra books because I guarantee you that you're going to hear from one of your friends in the next year. We're thinking about getting a dog. And I get that question all the time. And I think, you know, a copy of your book should be um, a place where they start because it really makes them invest the time and then they'll invest the love and make the difference. I, I think Beth, a, a final word has to go to the 60 people who worked on this because <laughs> I, I feel very uneasy when when anyone says the author of the book, I'm, I'm more the, the compiler of all these views from all over the place. And, you know, we, we, yeah, we were very... You're... We're very lucky to have so many experts and, and also Oksana Weber, who is the illustrator. She's a, an internationally famous Beautiful. artist who did an incredible work. So if you're buying the book, um, you're buying basically about 50 experts plus a work of art. Um, True. All, all combined in a labor of love. True. Yeah, I think, you know, you're being more humble than you should be, in my opinion, because you know, we all have these ideas and we all know from individual pieces that these are good ideas, but I think it takes um, someone with some sort of vision and reaction. You need the guy who got in the cage. You need the guy who got in the cage to make this difference. And you did. And you did. So I encourage everybody to do that. I encourage you to get the book, share the book, give people the book that want the dog, you know, even read it if you have a dog, because it'll help you at any, any stage along there so that you have this better relationship. When we start to do that, then we'll see the demand be for people to get dogs who understand what that means instead of just simply the demand for picking up a dog from the local pet store. So great, great, great reactions could come from that. If just like you, people thought, what if we all worked on this together? So I hear you saying, well, no, no, it's not me. It's, it's the 60. That's my point. The 60 happened because you brought them together and look at the difference you're making. So I'm, I thought I'm applauding you from over here in the States. So, well, if that's the, uh, the final words, then I just want to thank you again. This has been a terrific conversation. People can certainly reach out to me, Beth at wagtown.org, send me a note, messenger, whatever is easiest for you. I'm happy to connect you with the author and the team and all the people that have been involved in this, because each one of them, as you mentioned, is a superstar in their own little niche yeah. of what makes this all happen. So so I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I hope everyone out there watching or listening is happy to do the same and you'll be a part of making that difference happen. So, all right, everybody. Well, it was a pleasure again to talk with all of you and share the stories that of people and organizations and projects that are making a difference for animals everywhere. So until I talk to you again, keep wagging and tell your dog I said hi.